there are a number of titles that are recommended in the handout. If you only got one, it would be, and I will read from it this morning, the Lord gives me breath, Revival and Revivalism by Ian Murray. There's several that are referenced in the handout by Mr. Murray. But this one in particular is just outstanding. It, it addresses many of the myths that surround revival. And so I uh, particularly recommend it to you. Those of you who have your Bibles, whether they be electronic Bibles or leather Bibles, uh, you may be aided by going ahead and turning to Ezekiel chapter 37, and we'll be there probably in another six minutes. I'm going to um, attempt not to regurgitate much of what both Kevin and Brad have brought to us, but to put, uh, to scale it and to place a little more flesh on those bones. Jonathan Edwards probably provides the most lucid definition of revival. And as you all know, Jonathan Edwards was involved in the 1740s revival, particularly in New England. And he describes revivals as remarkable effusions of the spirit in special seasons of mercy. <laughs> Mr. Edwards points his finger to the Holy Spirit. Hey, y'all, the Holy Spirit is the shy one of the Trinity. Bearden said that the Holy Spirit secreted himself in the robes of God. But it's the Holy Spirit whose visitation brings the times of refreshing. The Lord God determines it. The Lord Jesus is sacrificed for it, but it is the third person of the Trinity that brings the flood of conversions. He brings that harvest season because he alone is the ambassador of heaven. And the tsunami of sacred influences that he brings into our lives exceed anything we can do or preachers can do or people can do. It, it, it comes from him. And what the Lord does is he bows the heavens and there's an inundation of grace by the God beyond all ple pleasing. Imagine God opening up a portal to heaven so you can look in. You get to enter Revelation 4. That's what you do. And that's what you do in revival. God makes it all real. And everyone experiences God's glory in the revival. Well, what about the unregenerate people? They experience it too. They don't experience it in the same way you do. It's more of a Hebrews 6 than a Hebrews 5. But they still experience it. And it affects their lives, the lives of their children and their children's children throughout the generation, just because God decides to do it. Now, how does it come about? Now, again, I stand shoulder to shoulder with what Kevin said last week. It's all God. And there's some things I say you need to write in pencil rather than pen so you can erase them. There's a place for you in the continuum of revival. It's a place, small place, but a huge service. Now, revival comes about not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. First Testament. Second Testament, the wind blows where it wishes. And though you hear the sounds of it, you do not know where it goes, or where it comes from. And so is everyone who is born of the spirit. So we have it in both Testaments. It is the magisterium of Scripture that brings the revival from God because he honors his word. Read for you from Mr. Murray's writing. And you'll appreciate this. I trust you appreciate all of it, but um, this is a quote from William Sweet, who was a Methodist but a church historian in the late 18th century, early 19th century, and he is writing particularly about the revival in Kentucky. 
And remember, then they called from Kentucky West the frontier. He writes, it is an interesting fact that most of the great American revival movements have come largely through Presbyterianism. And the great revival in the West is no exception. Why? Why would it come through Presbyterians? The magisterium of scripture. That's why. What you have is you have Calvinism coupled with the soul loss. You have the total depravity of man, the unconditional election of God, the limited atonement of Christ, the irresistible grace of God, and the perseverance of the saints, coupled with sola gratia, sola scriptura, solus Christus, sola fide, and so did they your gloria. So you couple the Cuban with solas, and all of a sudden, you come to the intersection of both Sinai and Gethsemane, and there's where you're going to find the world. If God's people will capture that, you'll be amazed at how God will honor his people. You know, I'm going to read a good bit today, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, an effective reader, but if I don't stay on task, the revival will come before we get out of here, but it won't happen on Sunday. <laughs> So, um, we'll read us another section from Mr. Murray's book about how your involvement invites revival. That's what characterizes revival is not the employment of unusual or special means, but rather the extraordinary degree of blessing attending the normal means of grace, i.e. anti-tinism, anti-altar call. There were no unusual evangelistic meetings, no special arrangements, no announcements of pending revivals. Pastors were simply continuing in the service they had conducted for many years. And that's when the great change began. That is why so many of them could say the first appearance of the work of revival was sudden and unexpected. Their theology taught them that there is no inherent power in truth to convert sinners, and they rejoiced in the knowledge that the size of the blessing which God is pleased to bring through the use of means is entirely in his own hands. So what he brings from the preaching is completely up to him, not to the preacher. As William Rogers of Philadelphia wrote to Isaac Bacchus in 1799, the revivals of religion which you speak of are peculiarly illustrative of the glorious doctrines of grace. The wind bloweth where, where it listed. On the subject of means, something needs to be said more particularly on prayer. This is where you come into the equation. <laughs> As with the truth that is preached, prayer has no inherent power in it. Scripture and prayer only have the power that God give them, gives to them. It's all about God, not about us. On the contrary, true prayer is bound up with a persuasion of our inability and our complete dependence on God. Prayer, considered as a human activity, whether offered by few or by many, can guarantee no results. But prayer that throws believers in heartfelt need on God with true concern for the salvation of sinners will not go unanswered. Prayer of this kind precedes blessing, not because of any necessary cause and effect, but because such prayer secures an acknowledgement of the true author of the blessing. And where such a spirit of prayer exists, it is a sign that God is already intervening to advance his cause. 
where prayer is true prayer, where people are praying in repentance, where, where they're praying in complete dependence upon the Holy God, God's already at work. It's just like when someone's born again. You're only born again after you're regenerate. You can't be born again until God's done the work there. Wait a minute, doesn't we're born again mean you're regenerate? Yes. But God's work precedes your recognition of what God's done. If mom and daddy buy you a bicycle for Christmas, you love the bicycle, but they had to buy a bicycle first to give it to you. It doesn't just appear, it doesn't just come down the chimney. And it cost them. Just like it cost God his only begotten son. Your prayers are the morning stars of the Bible, the forerunners. God's the one who brings the daylight. And what your prayers do is they serve as escorts to what occurs. They don't control what occurs. Remember, the Holy Spirit cannot be bribed. You've got nothing he needs, nothing. He doesn't even need your availability. He makes you available because he changes your nature. That's the working of the Holy Spirit. He, he is so unwestern. He is so heavenly. And so when you begin to pray, what you're doing is you are engaged in the labor of ushering the Holy Spirit into your world. We can't get to his world, but he can come to ours. We need him to come to ours. Now, what's the impact of revival? Contrition, conviction, conversion, sanctification, indescribable joy. Revival results in evangelicals coming out of their closet into their marketplaces because we are ashamed of the gospel. And so he has to take away that shame in our spirits so we'll exercise it in the marketplace. And what the Lord God does is he he brings his breathtaking majesty from heaven into our world. He's transforming God. He transforms the world. What do you think the church in Ukraine is praying for right now? Those are lovely people. Had an occasion for a couple of weeks to be in the midst of Ukraine on a mission trip. They are lovely people. Normal people. And they've got nothing. But they've got access to everything. And we all are in Ukraine every day of our lives. We just don't realize it. There's nuclear war going on all around us. And but for the Holy Spirit, we're not here anymore. This this Holy Spirit could bring for a Bible. He so affects congregations that they either hate their preacher or they hate their sin. They cease manipulating and managing sin and they mortify it and sin. Lord, I just want to get rid of it. What the Holy Spirit does is he transforms the Acts 8 and 9 souls of the 21st century into the Pauls of the first century. He makes us like the Apostle Paul. He just says, you, you have the same kind of faith we have. And I remember the first time I read that with eyes that I could see. I said, no, Peter, my faith can't control me. It's nowhere close to yours. And Peter would probably say, when was the last time you denied Jesus to his face? You've got the same kind of faith Peter's got. And so what that results in when the Holy Spirit comes in revival 
There's an unconformity about your life. You quit, you cease conforming to what you've been conforming to. Your values shift. The Bible becomes what you want to talk about. I just want to talk about scripture. There's a pressing into that narrow gate. We're going to see that in, a, in an extra biblical revival a little later. Um, people prefer going to church and prayer meetings to sporting events. You know, there was a season in the Carolinas when what's known now as Carolina Panthers were trying to determine would they locate in Charlotte or would they locate in and at that time, it was Columbia. The senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church had the pastors at First Presbyterian Church praying that the Panthers would not locate in Columbia. A businessman wouldn't have joined in that. But that's what the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church was praying. Because he said, if he comes in, he can win the ball game. And they think that's what a ball game is played with their bow to their teenage idols. He said it in a little nice way. But that's what he meant. Well, in revival, the they don't go to Charlotte. They come to the corner of Lady of Marion Street. And there's not enough room to fit them in the church. We got to be Spartanettes. We'll give them a chip. And the, the Phyllis's and the gyms, they can't come in because they love Jesus. So they got to wait and come back on Sunday night. We just let the unbelievers come in in the morning. That's what happens in the wild. Those who are not God's people become God's people. And those who are God's people, they start living like God's people. Conversations change. Brad Melody, all they talk about spiritual matters because that's what the Holy Spirit does to them because that's their highest value that there's there's a, a movement by single talented saints to utilize the talent to its fullest extent and all of a sudden they recognize oh I've got more than one talent because I finally started exercising the one I have that's what occurs in the Bible now, why so few? Why so seldom? Has God run out of grace? Has he run out of mercy? As the apostle would say, may it never be. No, that's not the problem. The way it is. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to be in chapter 37, as you might suspect. We're 600 years pre Jesus. And the people of the Hebrews are in exile because of their sin. And if you would read 2 Kings chapter 17, you'd see in detail their sin. Ezekiel is in exile. He probably died in time because they would be there for 70 years. And the Lord comes to Ezekiel in the power of the Holy Spirit, much as he came to Jesus in both Luke and Matthew chapter 4. That spirit, the spirit, carried Jesus into the wilderness. He comes to Ezekiel when he's already in the wilderness. Join me in chapter 37, verse 1, where God says, Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass along the roundabout, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. Now, God uses his uh, relational name there twice, the, the Yahweh name, the Tetragrammaton. Because what Ezekiel needed most was a relationship. Because ever, everyone around him, they were dry bones. So God's the protagonist. And what God does is he sets Ezekiel in the valley of vision. 
And Ezekiel has a forced study of death. He cannot avoid it. God says, full of bones, very many, very dry. There's a national cemetery that Ezekiel is looking at of churchmen who have the form of godliness, but none of its power. They were churchmen, and all they had was a surface religion. They were barren, evident, scattered. It was to steal a portion of the title. It was sin accomplished. That's what death is. That is sin's finality every time. Verse 3. He said to me, Son of man, I remember Ezekiel was only one of three people God called Son of Man. Jesus is the other one. Y'all all know the third. Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh Lord God, you know. God asks the ageless question. You remember God said to the church in Sardis in chapter 3 of Revelation, You have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Oh, you got the name. Ezekiel answers God in humility. Oh, Lord God, you know. When Sarah was 90, you would have thought her womb would have been a tomb, but it was not. It was a national incubator at 90. Oh, and by the way, her husband wasn't real sporty. He was 100. So it wasn't those two. You see, as Paul says, God gives life to the dead and he brings into being that which does not exist. How does that? Well, there's no way we can win this war. There's no way that teenager will ever be converted. There's no, but God does not tolerate the phrase, there's no way. Because he is the way and the truth and the life. And things happen through him. They don't happen anywhere else and under any circumstances. Verse 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy with me both. Now, y'all, the word prophesy there is our word to preach. So don't miss the importance of the preaching. Prophesy with these bones and say to them, oh, for our bones, hear the word of the Lord. God is, he tells us through Ezekiel, scripture arrests death. That's one of the functions of scripture. The Bible regenerates, it revives. And, and Ezekiel uh, is told what he needs to do. And, and I think this is important in the churches today. It, God says to Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You can't read it in your English version, but the verb to hear is an, is an imperative verb. The preacher is not to beg the congregation. The preacher is to command the congregation. You hear these words. You see, the preacher speaks with authority. You know, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, the, the, when you get to the chapter after the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 8 of, of Matthew, do you remember what amazed people? It was that Jesus taught with authority. We don't need begging preachers. We need preachers who have stood in the council of the Lord. They know the word of God and they preach with authority. Not arrogance, but with confidence in Christ. This is what he's called me to do. I'm fulfilling his mission. This is what I'm going to do. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. Ezekiel's God's preacher. Verse 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Hey, Y'all, God just told Ezekiel to preach, but but God's going to be the first preacher. God's going to speak to the bone before Ezekiel does. In revival, people come into the churches with heaven already in their hearts. God's already done the work. They just come in to get it confirmed. Right. Thus said the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I, not Ezekiel, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive so you will know that I am the Lord. 
God preaches first, and he preaches, he uses breath, ruach, R-U-A-H, is the Hebrew word. He uses that twice then, because you're first, you're last, and you're more significantly needing this entire life, is breath. You need the spirit. You need the ruach. There's nothing more important than him. You're still born until you're twice born. And the Spirit says, come to life, come alive. The Spirit wouldn't have to say that if they weren't already dead. It was like Jesus on the cross. He didn't swoon. He was dead as a hammer. And God brought him back to life. God did that. That's who does it here. That's who does it in the Bible. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. God brings you to life. You, he said, you will know that I'm the Lord. That's God's chief aim in life, is for you to know that he's the Lord, you're not. He's the Lord. He's the Yahweh of your life. He's the Adonai of your life. He's the Elohim of your life. He's all your life. God's chief end is to glorify himself and for you to enjoy him forever. So he said, that's his purpose. Verse 7. So I prophesied, as I was commanded, Ezekiel did what God said to do. We would be amazed if we just did what God told us to do. So I prophesied, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, or no word for that, be voice or thunder. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews upon them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. They had the appearance of life, but no life. How many people are serving in churches today, in pulpits, as deacons, as elders, vestry, council, whatever they call it? They got all this. They have the appearance of life. They dress right. They have the right words. There's no power. All they have is the appearance. And this is an actuality because they don't have the spirit. And he says that there was no breath. You know, the origin of the species is not Darwin didn't touch it. God does in chapter 2 at verse 7. Steve with the dust of the earth. And God took him, he breathed into him the breath of life, and Steve became a living being. That's the origin of the species. Verse 9. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Well, I want you to preach to the Ruach, I want you to preach to the Spirit. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded. And the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Ezekiel didn't do it. God did. That's what Ezekiel wants everyone to know. And the new birth is self-revelational. How many times have you met someone for the first time and the glory of the Lord's all over their face? You've never met them in your entire life. And you walk up to a stranger in, in Ukraine and you look into their face and there's no question the Holy Spirit lives right there. None. Why? Because the Spirit is always self-revelational. The Spirit wants you to know He's there. He's not playing games with people. He's not going to give you a head fake. No, no. He's real. He's right there. You, just as you're not a person without generation, you can't be a Christian without regeneration. Unregenerate humanity is an embryonic hell. They just don't know it. Now, in the interest of time, we'll fast forward to verse 14. I'll put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I'll place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. 
Life requires the Holy Spirit. Um, three times God refers to himself in that one verse. Uh, and twice by Yahweh. And as we move to a couple examples of extra biblical outside the Bible, the Bibles, remember what value are families and lands and comforts and pleasures and places absent the Holy Spirit, absent the pearl of great price. How many people move for a job rather than moving? That's where the Spirit's working. That's where I'm going. The riches from that job are going to perish. The Holy Spirit will not. I'm through with Ezekiel. I trust you not through with us. I'm going to give you several examples in the time that's remaining of extra biblical reliance. One, I'm going to give a great awakening here in America in the 1720s to the 1740s with uh, Jonathan Edwards and also George Whitby, uh, both of whom were uh, preachers of the doctrines of grace and both of their own men. And as many of you know, Benjamin Franklin was a dear friend of George Whitby. And there's no indication Dr. Franklin was ever born again. But he was a dear friend. As a matter of fact, there's an account where every time Benjamin Franklin went to one of George Whitfield's messages in Philadelphia, Whitfield actually died in the United States. I think he made nine trips. There's an orphanage in Savannah that still exists that he set up. We actually had an opportunity a couple of years ago to uh, be involved in a wedding at the Whitfield Orphanage in Savannah. Lovely place, Hans. Anyway, uh, Dr. Franklin, who was a wealthy man, on a particular occasion, he would he did not bring any funds to support Mr. Whitfield to one of the occasions where the Lord brought him to Nonetheless, he was so moved by the Holy Spirit as Mr. Whitfield was preaching that he went around to his friends picking up money so he could give it to Whitfield. He, just, he couldn't resist. And as you know, uh, Dr. Franklin, he was, he was George Whitfield's publisher. And he writes that Whitfield could speak from the balcony to 40,000 people at the same time and they could hear him. No amplification. The Holy Spirit does that. I mean, that, that. That's who accomplishes that. Now, this is Dr. Franklin's um, summation of revival in the New England area, Philadelphia. He writes, it was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. In the manners, that's M-A-N-N, -N, not M-A-T-T. In the manners of our inhabitants. You see, in revival, people's manners actually change. They say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, rather than brusque yeses and no's. Manners change. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious. So that one could not walk through the town, he's talking about Philadelphia, in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. So revival has no respect of classes. Every street, those on that side of the tracks and those on this side of the tracks, we're all singing songs. That's the change that revival brings about. And we'll go to the Welsh Revival. Uh, 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 it, time is uh, the nemesis of fallen man. Uh, Welsh Revival, 1904, 1905. Ian Murray, uh, Mr. Murray, on occasion, we had an opportunity to be with him. And Mr. Murray, I said, Mr. Moore, tell me about 1904 revival. 
you know, Mr. Morgan was not there. He, he's, he's still alive. He's not that old. But he had interviewed people who were part of the 1905 revival in Wales and reduced that down in the right. And so he had the, 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 the personal relationships with him. Anyway, you guys. Mr. Murray said that one older gentleman told him that he heard that God oftentimes uses only one person to bring revival. In this case, it was generally Evan Roberts. It, there, were, there were some others, Daniel Rowland and Howell Harris, but it was generally Evan Roberts. And this particular gentleman, Mr. Murray was talking with, he said that he heard Evan Roberts preach and that when, as he was preaching and when he got through preaching, there was complete silence. There's no one slaying the spirit. There's no speaking in tongues. He said the, 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 my word gravitas of the moment was so significant that all you could do was sit there. No one wanted to leave church. They wanted it to be a perpetual Sunday. They just sat there in awe and wonder what the Lord could do. And as y'all know, Wales is a, is a coal mining area. And they bred Welsh ponies to be very short so that the Welsh ponies could get in the the mines and pull big carts and so on. Anyway, when when revival came to Wales, uh, the men were converted in the mines, and, and it's described as tears running down their blackened cheeks. The men were converted in the mines, and the way they had talked. The ponies to follow their command was by cussing out. <laughs> well, we hear a lot of that in the culture today. Yeah. Well, when they were revived, they quit cussing. How about that? Oh, you mean a cussing man is a cursed man? I didn't say that, but here it is. Did. They quit cussing. So they got the they got the pit ponies in there. Pit ponies will be pulling this coal out. They start, well, they don't cuss anymore. Well, the pit ponies just stand there looking at them. The horses don't know what to do. They've lost their commanding sinfulness. That's the after. There was um The jails in Wales closed down. The jailers, people will come and bring in stolen goods back to the jailers. The jail, their, their facilities were full. They had to rent warehouses to put stolen goods in for people to come and get their goods. That's what happens in revival. But revival cannot be separated from holiness. The, 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 the village of Kidderminster, which is where Richard Baxter was, but it was a, they had factories, looms, and it, one of their major exports was cloth for books. This was before we had paperback books. Everything was cloth now. Well, the factories in Kidderminster could not keep up with the demand for cloth, for books, because people were reading about, about what goes on in God's world from God's people. They had a supply chain problem. We, we can have that again. In, in, in Wales, um, there was a soccer team called the Ross Rangers. It was a professional soccer team. And the soccer team went out of business because people went to church instead of coming to the soccer games. But the, 
Christianity literally puts people out of business. That's why many business people don't like Christianity. Because you start living the way God wants you to live. You know, Elder Roberts, who was particularly gifted for this, he reports that he was just a regular preacher. Just like regular preachers are. And he said one day he went into a church and he started preaching the same sermons he'd been preaching, same way, same everything. But all of a sudden, the people responded differently. All of a sudden, they were going to their knees. And then Robert said, That had nothing to do with me. I wouldn't do anything any different. It's the Holy Spirit. Well, it lasted, and Evan Robert says, and, and y'all, you know, there's no. Mm, no bold lines with revival that starts on January 1st and ends December 31st. It, it, you don't have those kind of bold lines in revival. But Evan Roberts reports, he said one day, he went in to preach just like he preached before. Everything the same. And nothing happened during the sermon. Nothing. He said just the Lord given and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was just for a season. And he had it for that season. He, Evan Roberts says the public houses, that would be what we would call five things. The public houses closed because nobody was going into garage shops. No one wanted, people were surrendering their tobacco and their alcohol. I'm going to read you one quote and then. And then um, I have to hush. Um, and again, this is from Mr. Mark. In revival, God becomes a serious threat. Men are aware of eternal issues in the presence of God, and the power of the gospel disturbs their spiritual sleep. Thousands are affected. And even influenced by revival, who never experienced salvation. You see, in revival, the world becomes a matter of the past. And all that you have before you is God Almighty.